Welcome to this uh, podcast episode um, in Coffee Science for Coffeepreneurs, where uh, today's guest is uh, Venter Brady, uh, and I'll introduce him in a second. Um, and we are here at the university in, uh, in Copenhagen at uh, what I call Center in Consumer Science, but Venter, really, uh, your department is called Design and Consumer Behavior, right? Yes, that's right. Yeah, well, it's actually a section. Uh, Oh yeah, it's yeah. a section. Yeah, yes, oh, the, yeah. the department of uh, food science. <laughs> uh, so, uh, and in fact, uh, in th- in the sections we have two research groups, and I am in the research group uh, or leading the research group uh, sensory science and consumer behavior. Okay, so just to be uh, sensory uh, science and consumer behavior. Yeah, yeah. Okay, and uh, th- that's the uh, understanding the org chart of of the university is kind of is is a subject in itself. <laughs> so I just want to um, to mention for for the, for the listeners um, uh, the way that I perceive you as somebody who came from outside and kind of made my way in. So, um, um, and I don't know if you agree about this. Uh, uh, characterization that I that I do but this is at least uh, my perception so so for, for me you are you're a real professor in the sense and I found out uh, by navigating the the academics for, for a while that the, what's the difference and one of the things that I that, that I kind of uh, that came to my mind is that that you have uh, 90% of your books, articles, and uh, and the authors uh, of relevance in your subject field and universities, you have it in your working memory, right? I have a lot of books, and I might have 10% of it in my working memory, but it seems like this is what you do, and you've done it for so many years, and that is something you have in your working memory. And that's uh, worth a lot for, for somebody like Ida and me uh, when we need some, some help. It, it's very quick to ask you about things and, and get an answer uh, easily. Um, but but the another thing uh, this is not this is not something that you can just ex- access because when when we when I started here the first project I did was ten years ago was the Christian Hansen project that I did here and I think that was the first time I kind of really got to know you I had been in the dairy department and the chemometrics before and that was the first project I did where I kind of understood who Venda is what sensory science is at uh, at all really. And um, and uh, and and then I I understood that uh, you you are really busy man because you are running so many projects and you have so many commitments that you don't just walk into vendor's office and kind of get a project running right you really have to earn it and uh, so Ida and I we were really thinking a lot about how to do it and uh, and then I remember we met in the kitchen once out there. Um, and by coincidence, and then we started to talk, and, and that was just an amazing conversation. So I thought, this might work. Uh, there was just a connection, so I thought, this, if we just keep on uh, watering this, uh, I, think, I think we have a chance. <laughs> Obviously, you don't know all this, but, but, but this is, and, and this is funny, because one of my friends, he's a professor at uh, a CBS in, I think it's called Organizational Economics, and you can probably recognize this. So in a, in a, if you have a network, you have got people who are uh, connected to a lot of people. And they, in a sense, they have all the resources, but they also have the burden. So the best one-offs are the one just next to somebody in a nexus. <laughs> because they have access to just getting really good information very quickly, but they don't have the burden of, of all the connections. <laughs> yes. So this, uh, and this is something that just happens, right? And this is where, and obviously you, you need to kind of have to have some uh, content that is interesting, aligned with where you are going with your priorities in your project before you can kind of tap into. Uh, so we, we consider us, ourselves very fortunate to have been kind of lucky enough to, uh, to s- squeeze our projects into aligned with where you are going with, uh, with your projects. Uh, and another thing uh, uh, with with a professor at your level is you've got your own standards, <laughs> and that's also what we talked about in the beginning here. You really want to know where things are going. You're not just doing something. You really want to know where it's going. And sometimes, and we also talked about this. I'm a small company, so sometimes I'm co- uh, looking a bit more what's good enough, kind of to get away. Where you? No, 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 no. 
that's not the question. <laughs> or at least uh, we need to discuss a bit what's the standard for what is good enough, right? And that's also something that has been really interesting to see over time, also how a project is run. And this is really something we appreciate a lot, that you know, sometimes you kind of forced our focus elsewhere. And we understood, oh, if we didn't do that, the project would actually have derailed. So that, that's also the things with the, all the experience you have with the running projects that's really valuable as well. Um, and then also, uh, this is just to give the, the listener who doesn't know, perhaps they don't have a, the podcast is for scientists, but primarily for, for coffeepreneurs, right? People in the coffee business. So I'm just trying to paint a picture for them, uh, kind of who you are uh, in, in this interview. Uh, and another thing that that, um, uh, that that we found out is that luckily, because I thought you were a really tough person, <laughs> and then when we did the project together and it derailed a lot of times, I found out you were a really caring person as well. And that was uh, pretty good because otherwise our project probably would have ended a few times by now. So when you kind of commit to something, you really care about the people and the project, and that's something that has we also really have appreciated. And I didn't really expect that when I didn't before I get, got to know you but that that's just a, a, a good surprise uh, so we really uh, feel ourselves very fortunate to be under your wings in the PhD project that uh, Ida uh, my colleague is running in sensory learning under you and we got the idea I think eight years ago by now and uh, it seems like we can see the uh, the light at the end of the tunnel um, so Venda, that was just to make sure that uh, my audience got a picture, at least uh, as how I perceive you. Um, and also because th this is why it's interesting for my, my listeners to, to get to tap in. And also this hour that we have now is something that we booked, I think, three or four months ago. Because so I really appreciate that you even want to take your time. I know you've got a lot of things you could have, have done rather than, than sitting here. So that, that's really great. So what I want to discuss today, uh, I, unless you really disagree with what I said about you, <laughs> I'll just go straight to the podcast. <laughs> yeah, just please go, go ahead. To... Great. Yeah, because uh, uh, the coffee uh, podcast is called Coffee Science for Coffee Preneurs. And my assumption is that, that science, oh, I know that science is not implemented in the, uh, implemented in the coffee business. Uh, and, and I can see how how much cost and waste that's related to not thinking strictly about if I want to do something, science can help me be specific about what I want to do and how to get there without wasting time on, on bad conclusions. Um, so uh, that's the whole point and that's why I'm in, in inviting people from the coffee industry and, uh, and scientists to comment on my uh, podcast where I'm really trying to go deep in theory of science first and see how that can be a basis of making right conclusions and picking good theories and, uh, and, uh, and kind of uh, reject bad theories. So um, my first question is, uh, what is your first thoughts uh, f uh, about the episodes uh, that you heard in terms of what do you think about the theory of science part? But also, do you see any immediate application or something where it kind of struck you as relevant or something mm, like that? Yeah, yeah. Based on your experience. <clears throat> no, I, I think uh, I, I like sort of the way uh, you approach it because uh, if you look at uh, sort of the theory of science part, that's that's quite a hefty uh, part in in, in in trying to go all the way from that to trying to do something in the coffee, uh, which is sort of very applied or something that is very concrete. Uh, so in that way, I, I, I like that you try to, to go all the way back to the theory of science uh, and, 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 and technologies and how uh, uh, the, the thinking that has been developed uh, there uh, sort of uh, sievers uh, into the coffee. Uh, because you're, you're right that um, if, uh, when, when I first uh, met you many years ago, uh, uh, I, I, what I appreciated is, in fact, that you as a small uh, company um, wanted to uh, actually do scientific uh, uh, approaches uh, to the coffee uh, making and the roasting process, uh, the tasting, uh, the sensory aspects and so on. So, so in that, uh, th that time, I, I, I sort of thought like, oh, this is actually quite interesting because uh, somebody that actually wants to have uh, the practice to work, but actually understand what's happening and and thereby also needs to uh, 
yeah, uh, run experiments uh, to to confirm certain ideas and and and, and use uh, you can say uh, the methodologies that we have developed in food science, uh, the natural sciences, but also in sensory science, so more the experimental psychology, um, uh, and 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 really uh, took that serious. Uh, and, and I think that's a challenge also because when you then look at uh, how your day-to-day -day business is, is with uh, yeah, a whole range of coffee uh, uh, makers, uh, small, uh, very agile to maybe a little bit more slower, longer term. And then uh, trying to implement uh, sort of the theory of science in that uh, is sort of a... Uh, you can say it's a, it's a, it's a challenge because uh, as you also see is uh, that... Uh, the theory of science is not developed in one day. Uh, that is in not even decades. That is centuries. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so, so in that way, um, it's uh, you. You can say the, how the sciences uh, develop. Uh, it's sort of like a slow, slow-moving learning uh, exercise that that develops over many years. Uh, and 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 you can see there is some kind of a diversion in the day-to-day -day coffee branch and business, and then having to deal with uh, the sciences that uh, go slow. But the good thing is with a slow, slow moving thing is that you have time to think and you have time to design valid experiments. You can then get data, you can give interpretation and, and gradually you, you actually learn something about the phenomenon. And then that learning is, you can say, universal because once you have build a knowledge base, you can always reflect to say like, okay, that is actually, or refer to that's actually something that we have learned. Um, whereas if you are in the day-to-day -day business uh, where you have to make quick decisions and then maybe good is good enough uh, kind of thing, which is uh, of course needed uh, because otherwise you cannot move. Uh, uh, but, but, but then uh, you can say like, well, okay, if you want to understand uh, the phenomena, then, then it's nice to take some of that into this sort of science field and when, when people have time to actually really go to un to the understanding uh, level. And, and, and that I admire in your company is that you sort of have a lack in each of these uh, uh, areas. And, and you, you are in your company, you are very well in, in sort of taking then what you can learn from the science in, into your business. And you n also know that that's a long-term or long-term perspective. And I think you have built uh, very good relationships here between not only myself, but also other people here in the department and, and elsewhere. Uh, and I think that has, um, that has been, uh, I, I think that's quite unique. Uh, uh, but that's also maybe because of your background, because now I'm putting it a little bit back to you, where I think <laughs> you're originally also being trained as a scientist uh, in your education. And, and I think uh, that, that's, uh, that helps a lot. Uh, because you can see both sides uh, uh, in, from your perspective. Uh, yeah, and also. it's funny because in people in business, they are also really serious about what they are doing. So they are not just uh, cutting corners, but they have other uh, focus areas, right? And this is where I'm kind of... Uh, I, I actually see business people being very serious uh, about they, what they do. And I also see a lot of similarities. For example, your way of... Uh, of, of handling uh, your life is very entrepreneurial, right? You you have to really be visionary and but also handle a lot of resources. So that's also at the professor level. You are not there if you're also not entrepreneurial, right? You need to manage resources, organizations, ideas, and 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 so on. So there's a lot of similarities, but the subject matter is very different, right? Uh, so if you are for example, a skilled marketer, you really know what you're doing. It's not a coincidence that, that you have success if you have it long term. It's because you really know something, have a theory and you've got handcraft. But but it's it's just different subject matter areas. And this is where I really this is where I see people are serious in both camps, right? But it's just understanding the subject matter. And this is where I really want the science. And that's also in my podcast. I've kind of boiled it down to eight points. Scientific theory is not difficult to understand because it's just really common sense if you really want to make sure not to make a wrong conclusion, right? <laughs> and in, in that sense, there's similarities in business and science, but it's just very different subject matters. And I think science has had a long tradition. For example, in chemistry, right, you cannot see molecules. So you have to really be careful not to make wrong conclusions because then your whole picture of how molecules and how they interact will fall together. And this is where sometimes marketing, because you don't have a, a, a kind of physical subject matter, you can kind of make your stories. And this is where so chemistry and, and, and storytelling in that sense is, 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 a, 
is a bad uh, ma- marriage, and we see that a lot in the coffee business. But I, I still think that there's a lot of similarities on the personal level, taking things seriously, working hard to really understand mechanisms, and this is this is where where I, I see that there are uh, uh, kind of uh, equal approaches that can be bridged. So I definitely see that there's a, there's there's a, a possible connection. But I, I'm also interested in so theory of science. I'll cut this out. I'm just checking the sound and it's recording and I can see. And could you also say something, Venda? Yes, hello. Yeah, so there's sound. I just got this anxiety. I'll just double check that the record is showing record and the sound. I'll cut it out, but you know, I just okay. need to double check. <laughs> it yes. would be a catastrophe. Um, and also see it up here that it shows. Oh, that it is recording. Uh, Rick. Uh, it it is recording. Everything is recording. I'm just yeah, so yeah. paranoid about not yeah. like getting. <laughs> okay. Nice. So what I'm I'm a bit curious because when I I studied uh, biology and philosophy and I really loved theory of science. But theory of science, I remember when I studied biology, was about ah yeah that's a bit when pe- that's a bit the talking classes that you don't have to take serious. And I taught the theory of science and uh, and um, and research design at Panum for five years. Uh, was an assisting teacher, and it was very clear to the medical students that ah, you've got anatomy, biochemistry, and then there's this theory of science. Well, there's a compendium. We'll show up. We'll half read it and discuss something. It's the kind of the soft part, right? So often it's a bit neglected as a really useful. Uh, and uh, what I would call actionable, you know, that that you need to understand it and make certain decisions in the light of how you understand it. So for me, it's not a soft thing. It's really what structures your 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 the way that you establish concept that you operate from in product development and quality control. So I don't know if if my approach to to theory of science for you is if there's also an element of of novelty. Um, in the way that theory of science is perceived as the kind of the soft science uh, or soft subject, even not even a science, right? It's just a lot of ideas. So how how do you handle theory of science as a as a kind of a subject here? How serious is it taken in in the curriculum? Is it something that the how many ECTS points is it? And uh, I'm just curious because I don't know the answer to that question uh, really. No, I, I think actually here in Denmark, by by, by law, uh, uh, when you uh, follow uh, this uh, education at the universities, that you need to have uh, in 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 our subject area, you need to have a part of your curriculum uh, on the theory of science. Yeah, that's by uh, regulated by law that you yeah. need to include that uh, in the education. That's a good start, uh, <laughs> and that's good. So even food science uh, students, which is actually quite an applied uh, field in a way, yeah. or quite an integrated field. Uh, they also learn about the theory of science, um, but actually, I, I m- disagree uh, to some de- to some extent that this is sort of the soft part. Uh, I, um, what is soft and what is ha- uh, hard? Uh, because I think it's actually quite complicated. And if you start to look into the uh, philosophers and what they have uh, read, these texts they are quite hefty <laughs> <Yeah>. to understand, <laughs> uh, and you need to spend a lot of time if you really want to understand it. So. So uh, and there is a, and as I say, when once you start uh, in 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 one uh, uh, part, uh, then you need to read more, and it, you know you, you you go into a lot of uh, ph- philosophical uh, literature and then and, and 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 textbooks, and so that gets very complicated. And I think it's maybe more that the students perceive this as something like okay, it's something we have to do. Um, yeah. And then uh, they can't see the relevance uh, necessarily because they know if you study medicine, it's more important uh, to learn about autonomy and about the physiology, uh, etc. So, 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 uh, so then they say like, I, I cannot use this for anything, and it's maybe more that they don't see the direct usefulness uh, in terms of uh, skills uh, that they uh, learn, but. I think you need to be a little bit older than to to learn to appreciate it, and that's also when I heard your podcast. Also, I thought like that was actually very nicely explained and and very clearly brought, and um, and then it sort of uh, gets you to think a little bit uh, like, oh yeah, yes, I I learned also about it, and yes, it's uh, and and then you sort of start thinking again, like going back into your daily practice as a professor at the university, like how much actually am I using that in in my daily life, and and I think. It is in in the way we we approach um, uh, 
you can say uh, in, in in my field is the sensory science. So how we how we measure things and how we how we give interpretation and how we deal with reliability of data that we collect and 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 the whole discussion about uh, 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 you know causal relationships, uh, things like that. Uh, that, that we're not really uh, putting that uh, first on the agenda, but it's always there. It's always in the way of thinking. And especially in my position, I challenge my students then. Uh, because if you find a correlation, then you say, okay, yeah, it's it's a correlation. It's, it can be very interesting, but is a causal? Uh, what is the causality underneath? Yeah. Is there a causal relationship here? Or is it just a correlation? And, and, and sort of in the interpretation of that, that's always where I have to challenge my students because they not always have that kind of thinking uh, because they maybe just get excited with the result. Um, and then in the end, it's also uh, like, what is validity? Uh, sort of like, what is a valid uh, result? And, 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 and over the years, you learn that, uh, you know, the way we approach science uh, or, or, or the approach our work, it, 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 it is sort of like um, we, we only can get kind of small snapshots of, of, of the whole picture. So we have... It is, um, uh, th and that's the advantage, I think, uh, of being a professor where you have a longer term perspective. So, like, I, I, I can think about uh, 20, 25 years in a career. Uh, so, I, I know in a certain per period I can do a little bit on this, and then uh, the, the, the wind of funding blows in another direction. So, <laughs> you move a little bit with that because you have to do that. But then five years later, it comes back again, and so you can add another part to the puzzle. So I have like a few puzzles that I'm building in my career, mm -hmm. and in these puzzles, I, I grade more and more knowledge, uh, for instance, about uh, food preferences. Uh, we have a lifespan approach, but when I want to apply for uh, funding for a lifetime uh, approach uh, for, for, for preferences, that's impossible. So you have a little bit that you learn about children and about infant preferences and how that is. And then later on, you get something for uh, older consumers or older uh, uh, adults. And then you have things about adults. And gradually, you can see uh, the bigger picture. Yeah. And and that is the advantage then uh, of, uh, of sitting here at the university where you have actually the time over a longer term career building up this knowledge base. And you always, and uh, we always sort of use this sort of scient scientific approach. And coming a little bit back to to the theory of science, is that that um, it's not it's not something that we we use on a day to day basis. It is sort of out there, but if you look at the the way we approach uh, our research, it's sort of an integrated part of that. Yes, and 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 could it could it be fair to say that when you're a student? you read about a lot of things that are kind of right or wrong. So you, you always kind of think that there's a right way of doing things because it, that, that's how it's done in the textbooks. But this is something that, that, that I, uh, when the research projects I've done, I'm not a professor at, I'm, <laughs> I was external lecturer at, at, for four years, so I'm in the other uh, end of that spectrum, uh, just barely. Um, um, but but uh, I think, kind of what I, you just said it comes with experience and and what i what i kind of think i have i've learned is that when you do a project there is no perfect way of doing it so there's a lot of trade-offs you have to do in the light of what you what you want to know most right so there's no perfect way of doing anything so you have to find the best way of getting the best data with the limited number of samples you can do and the limited resources you have. And this is where theory of science then starts to become interesting. So it might be that when the students move from the, the, the basic studies and uh, starting to do their own projects, then they cannot just do as in the textbooks because then it's not new anymore. And if they need to build something new, they cannot just pull a perfect way of doing it because they... They need to, to find the best compromise to get the best data about the one thing in the research question that they've decided to want to know something about. And then it all comes up, it becomes a bit more fringy, how to do things. And then you really need to have to think more about what you're doing at a deeper level. And this is perhaps where re, uh, uh, a theory of science can come in. But you said it came with, it, that it's just you said it comes with experience. And it might be come when you have been in the situations uh, enough times to kind of understand, okay, there is no perfect way of doing it. I just need to pick the best trade-off all the time. And if I order to do that, then I need to go a, a level deeper uh, to, to feel that I've 
made the right trade-off. Not that I've made the perfect uh, project, but I've made the best trade-off uh, to get to know what I what I want to do. So that that was just a, a thought when mm, you said yeah, that it yeah. comes with experience. That the experience might be that things becomes more and more fringy the more you uh, get to new knowledge, right? Yeah. I think also, I mean, uh, sort of we, we are trained uh, in the natural sciences, eh? and then uh, if you sort of uh, trained in chemistry and in physics, uh, uh, that, that, that then you can see like, okay, uh, in, you can do a lot uh, by first principles. Eh? Uh, you can sort of look into the thermodynamics and, and look into the different laws and so on, and then you could uh, sort of build up uh, uh, something all the way go to, for instance, the, the, the temperature of a cup of coffee, or yeah. you can then uh, look into the chemistry of uh, what is the, the chemistry happening in uh, the, the ro roasting and in the brewing uh, process. Uh, so, so, but then if you want to do everything by first principles, then uh, it will take you more than a lifetime, not even to understand just a little bit of the taste of coffee. So. So you have to go uh, also making shortcuts and say like, okay, how is it then that I can study uh, something? And it comes, for instance, to the taste of coffee. And then you say like, okay, uh, what what are the, uh, the 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 things in coffee that gives them taste? Uh, and then and then you go a little bit from the other uh, uh, side, and then you can say, okay, we can measure on the volatile components. We can look into the taste components, and we have all kind of methodologies of how to measure that. And then you also write that that uh, you have to make uh, shortcuts, but it depends on often at the research question that you want to answer. Yeah. And I remember uh, in my own PhD, my supervisor, he told me in the start of my PhD, when I also had all these sort of methodological challenges to say, like, you have two choices. You can spend uh, your whole PhD in developing a method that is really precise and can exactly measure what you want to measure. Or you can also say, like, okay, I go for a compromise and I actually move on to more study the subject that I want to study. And so uh, some people, they sort of are very concerned about the methods and, and, and uh, can they really precisely quantify something? Can they really measure what I want to measure? Or you say like, okay, I can measure uh, good enough, but actually my interest is more to study uh, the, the, the topic, for instance, about how you can get a good flavor in a cup mm. of coffee. And then you can say, okay, then we just employ the uh, sort of compromise method, but then we actually learn more about coffee rather yeah. than about how to do a, a good measurement. Yeah. And I think that's uh, also something that uh, is sort of part of this whole discussion, I think, also when uh, thinking about this uh, the theory of science, you could, you could spend uh, your lifetime on the philosophical part but you, you, you still are away from your taste <laughs> yeah. of a cup of coffee. So you need to sort of move on and get more concrete into uh, also what is it uh, you actually want to address. And then just to add one, one more thing, it's interesting with coffee that, um, uh, and, and I really appreciate uh, the people working on the practical side of coffee as well, because they have a lot of knowledge. Uh, and it's maybe not uh, done in a scientific manner, but it doesn't actually matter. They have just a lot of practical knowledge. And I think uh, the, 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 the interesting thing is if they find something, they say like, okay, we, we, we have this, uh, we observe this phenomena and we don't really know why, but, it, uh, but for us it's important. Then I think you can ma make the bridge to the science because exactly, then yeah. you can formulate a question that we can say, okay, that's interesting. And then we will dive into that aspect to try to understand what is happening. And I think that is... Um, uh, so interesting uh, also working with you uh, is to, to, to try to make this kind of bridge, uh, have some kind of a bridge function here. And, and, and then we can take certain aspects of the coffee to study, whereas, uh, uh, and, 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 and we do it in things that are relevant. Because you can uh, also, that's another thing, uh, scientists can, can do a lot of things that it could be extremely interesting within this scientific view, but, but the relevance for the for the application or for the for the for for for, for also for the business is sometimes uh, far to be seen and then you can say okay then it's still interesting to do these things in the science and to train scientists to because it is about also in some kind of an intellectual training of people if you think about phd students but then um, you know you know the application is a bit far 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 fetched and therefore what I like in the food science is that we, we have this kind of bridge uh, yeah. function uh, that we always have to think also a little bit, okay, what is it then important for, for, for the companies and for, for, the, for the application? Um, yeah, and, and this is where I completely agree. And the, the whole identity of Coffee Mind is to, to try to make that bridge. Um, so so I, I certainly do uh, uh, agree with that. 
I just I just wanted to also make a comment when you said that 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 you can be either very strong on method and never really get to the food substance. But I think, uh, and then, and as you also mentioned, that theory of science, you can kind of discuss that and the, you can read a lot of philosophy without getting, ever getting to the copy. But I, I, I don't completely agree because I think that theory of science, when you need to make some shortcut to make some, then you need to have some few principles that you trust to make something good enough, right? Because you, if it has to be good enough, there must be some small principles that you think, okay, if it's scientific, and this is something that I've started to say that, Science doesn't need to be any of anything about molecules. It does. It the only thing you need to uh, make something a scientific conclusion is to not be wrong in any of the obvious uh, typical biases you can do when you make a uh, make a conclusion. For me, that is science. Then another thing would be if things is an, uh, as, at a scientific level, it's it's published as a scientific paper. I also agree with that kind of that 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 is probably the most scientific things can get to get through a peer review review process. But I think much less can do it as well, as long as you're not making obvious um, uh, wrong conclusions. And, and that's mapped out in theory of science. What are the most obvious conclusions, such as a theory? If a theory can explain two opposite events, it's a bad theory. Because it has to, only, it has to commit to one, otherwise it can never be refuted or, or it doesn't really predict anything anyway, right? So it's, it's, it's pretty simple to explain, but there's just these, and that's what I've done in my eight podcast, these eight points, if you're not making anything wrong in each of, the, uh, each of these eight points, I think it's science, right? If you remember to keep everything equal when you set up a project and, 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 and this is everything that people, because people are, and you also said that people in the coffee business, they are experimenters. They experiment with things, but if you don't want to make a wrong conclusion, there are some principles that you need to remember about how you set it up and how you conclude on the data that you get out. And this is where I think theory of science, you don't need to kind of bury yourself in a cave uh, to kind of do that. That is what you need to make quick and dirty uh, conclusions, really. Uh, so, so, so I just want to kind of save theory of science of not being too geeky, but actually be what, be what you need. Uh, if you need to make a small thing that's quick and good enough, doesn't need to be scientifically published, but you just 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 don't want to make a wrong conclusion, and this is where I think theory of science is really useful. Yeah, yeah, no, that's true. But but and and, and sometimes uh, you can say in your observations that you do, bec uh, uh, you know, you may not be able to make a conclusion as well, uh, and then you need to make sort of the best guess. And and I think that's also how how, how science uh, works, because. Uh, uh, you know, if you look into uh, into food science, it, it, it's sort of a, a combining a, a lot of different disciplines, and each of these disciplines have uh, over years uh, developed theories uh, where you can say, okay, they are sort of for the very very uh, controlled systems, uh, and you can uh, look into a reaction where you have full control about the reactants and the conditions and everything. But then often uh, you can say the, these are into systems that are uh, often simplifications of what a food really is. So, so a lot of the, the, the theories in, uh, that we are dealing with in food science, uh, they are sort of made not necessarily into foods, but into uh, systems that are sort of oversimplifications, because then uh, you can sort of really purely study uh, the exact phenom phenomenon. Um, so the challenge of uh, food science is then to actually to know about these theories, but then trying to bring them together and then also saying like, okay, they may not always uh, be applied because uh, it, when you put a lot of these phenomena together, then something else uh, can yeah. arise. Yeah. Yeah. So I, I, what I then appreciate very much is that you say like, well, but then still we can do scientific observations on this. And I think uh, mm -hmm. really uh, the, yeah. the, 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 the difference between uh, this is that you say like uh, you, we need to take away our biases and our preconceived ideas about uh, how something is or should be uh, and then first uh, sort of uh, le let, let our analysis speak and then uh, see what the data tells us and then uh, if the data does not tell what we thought it uh, would tell then be critical in that like okay did we measure it in the right way should yeah. we measure it in another way uh, et cetera, et cetera. So, so the whole scientific approach to study 
uh, something and that's and not jumping to conclusions too quickly yes uh, being a little bit modest uh, that's also what what we learn when we train yes. ourselves or when we get trained at universities does not go too quickly uh, you can only then conclude about a particular thing but then the rest you can say we don't know and and that's the problem a little bit with science because then we say like oh but then the rest we don't know and and i don't really like that too much because <laughs> you somehow have some gut feeling what it could be so so you so i think scientists we we, we say okay we conclude on this yes but we have uh, some uh, some ideas of what what else could be and then we cannot really conclude on that but we can still give a good direction where to go and sometimes uh, scientists are too strict and especially when you think about theory of science then you can maybe be too strict uh, and, and and limit yourself that's a bit what i sort of think like i think we, sh we should dare as scientists we should dare to step a little bit outside our comfortable comfort zone because we could say okay we can only conclude this and then we stand very solid on that and we publish it and uh, and this is the proven fact but then uh, we could also dare to soften a little bit and say like yeah but uh, okay that's fine but how what is beyond that and how do you see the directions and i think scientists should also move a little bit uh, along that but then, uh, indeed, uh, try to see if we can then collect, again, solid knowledge uh, outside. But at uh, least you know exactly when you're on solid ground and when you're not, and you're honest about it. And, and this, yes. is, this is what yes. goes wrong. And this is my point number eight in my, my list. It is be self-critical, where the whole calculation of you know, everything else equal, did I really do things correct? But also calculating the p-value. What, what's the coincidence of just getting a random... Uh, uh, outcome. Uh, it's all this self-critic crit uh, critic approach and being modest about things. And this is this is for me. That's also a really uh, critical part of being scientific. Uh, uh, it, the self-criticism because there's a lot of that, in, and and this is really there's a lot of that in the coffee business. And I found out that there's a concept from uh, from sports uh, or fitness, the fitness world called bro science. <laughs> Have you heard about that? <laughs> no, no, I have not. So please explain. So, bro science is 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 uh, you know if you've been a, in a hard workout and you are then in the locker room and then, and then you're talking about physiology and the kind of amino acids that you started eating and how that changes uh, some. So people kind of using scientific language, and because they just read something in a magazine, they they kind of think that they understand it well enough to use it and kind of uh, use it as if it was science. And even the hypothesis, and this is the really dangerous part, when people do that and they, are, they don't even know what solid ground in, in science is, and then they start to use these concepts as they are uh, basing themselves on science. And this is, this is really, and this is also in my, uh, my episode about Plato, that was his problem, that you got the sophists who just had a lot of observations, so doxa or um, uh, opinion, so if you have, have to create a state where you can trust people making the decisions, how can you distinguish between people with just opinions and elevated knowledge? And for Plato, the method was what uh, elevated opinion into uh, uh, true knowledge outside the cave. So, um, and, and this is what we still need. So it, let, let's, say, let's say the coffee community is a small kind of kingdom, right? Who is? How do we make sure we can trust the people uh, um, generating the concepts that people are applying around the world? Right. That that's that's the question. And for me, uh, the answer is the scientific method and the eight points that I created. And this is where bro science becomes a problem because that's the sophist, right? They are speaking as if they are philosophers, but they don't have the proper method to make sure that they are even right in what they are saying. But the person who need who comes for education, they can't hear the difference because that's why they are seeking education in the first place. And this is something that we have a lot in in. Uh, there's a lot of bro science in 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 coffee where people claim um, to use a lot of uh, scientific concepts, and and then really it's just a hypothesis. And it's interesting enough as an hypothesis, but don't teach us uh, teach it as if it's a fact. Yeah, so yeah. people, and this is where uh, sensory science, where Ida and I so often feel that people, they have a good story about something that sounds amazing, like the relationship between curves and, and flavor. And then, but they don't really predict anything specific in flavor and they don't have any data. But, but as everybody just assumes that there's one best flavor, 
they assume that the person knows what the best flavor is, and if the curve looks like that, it's good, right? They don't predict anything about does the acidity go up or down, because does the bitterness go up or down? It's just it's best like this, as if the sensory part is just some an afterthought. You don't even have to take care to how do you collect data, how do you make sure to do it right. So this is this is really where, and this so for so go back. So a scientist is very conscious about when are they standing on solid ground and when are they not. And that and, and, and if they just aware about the difference, I think that that's 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 science, right? And this is also what I hope to get into the coffee business and that my whole podcast is to try to convince people you don't need to be a scientist to understand these eight points. As long as you apply them, you're actually doing science. And so self if you ask somebody and they uh, in the coffee industry and they just tell you a good story and you can feel they don't even want to go into the part where, uh, about self-criticism, then you know you're not speaking with a scientist. So a scientist would be curious about criticism because that builds the, what if I'm wrong? Isn't that curious? <laughs> because then we are on a more solid ground to the next level of this. If people are not self-critic, they are not scientists because they don't have this fundamental distinction and they don't really want science to progress because you can only do that by being self-critic. So that, that's for me, and this is why I feel that science doesn't need, sci theory science doesn't need to be geeky, and it's definitely actionable, and it's something that can be used to kind of weed out uh, opinion version, uh, versus uh, true knowledge. So it, it's just, uh, I was just excited about your, your model, because I, I felt that that was actually what I'm trying to promote with the uh, with the podcast yeah yeah talking about sensory science it's also if you if you look at the field it's not a very um, uh, old field at least in in the way we we, we uh, see it uh. but it uh, is 50 years right it's uh, yeah well, well I actually uh, I, I many years ago I, I had to give an opening speech at a conference at the Eurosense conference that was in 2014 and then I spent with a colleague in, in Sweden uh, some time to actually find out how did sensory science develop here in the Nordic uh, countries. Mm -hmm. And uh, and then we went first all the way back to the Vikings. Uh, and we you could see, go, this uh, is what I mean with a professor. <laughs> yeah. And, 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 and then uh, then we said, like, well, actually, it, it, it uh, probably developed earlier than that. But then uh, we took that as, as a mark point because they needed to make this uh, fermented uh, foods. Uh, because if they had to sail across the ocean or uh, across the seas, they needed to have food that could be preserved. Uh, but then uh, sitting on a boat and rowing to another country, it also needed to taste uh, good. <laughs> because otherwise the motivation to row was also uh, far to seek. So that was sort of like wh where we sort of start discussion. But then later on, when I say the more sort of contemporary sensory science as we have it today, actually also uh, developed in, in Denmark around the indu industrialization because then in the in the more industrialized uh, world, like in, 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 in the UK, for instance, then people moved to the cities and they needed to have more food and they could not produce f enough food in, in, in those countries. So they were looking into the Nordic countries to uh, start up a supply chain for foods. And then, uh, then it was about food preservation. So how you could preserve dairy foods, how you could pr preserve meat, and so on, and, and then there you needed to also have some quality standards. And uh, in those days, they did not have advanced instruments, so the sensors were quite important uh, to say if there was an off smell or if mm. there was uh, a texture that it was in within an acceptable range. So, so there actually the first standards were developed. And in, in fact, in the Nordic countries, uh, if you go ba very b back then, early 1900, uh, we already had uh, methods for quality assessment of foods using our sensors, and that's and, and some methodology around that. Uh, so if you then move further to uh, to today, then we also saw it in the brewing industry here in the Nordic countries. And in fact, the triangle test, which has always been shown as a standard method in the sensory field, is actually developed here in the in in, in Sweden, Denmark, that? and Norway. Is that uh, true? In yes, that's how the World Cup tasters uh, Reza, my my yeah, friend at yeah, the country, yeah. he's doing that. The world uh, next. Uh, yeah. that's the we, we, we found uh, the early literature, uh, late 30s, early 40s, uh, on the triangular test. And, and, and in those days, uh, there was no triangle test. So they had to develop it themselves as a quality control tool to, to, to see whether uh, a fermentation 
deviated from uh, from a, a known standard, so they needed to That's do these amazing. tests. And if you look into these uh, publications uh, from those days, they, you know, you, all the statistics were written out uh, manually because there were no computers. <laughs> and so the statistical tables had to be yeah. developed. Uh, so you had engineers, uh, people in the that had uh, sort of uh, some, some, some statistics training, so they were all called in to help developing uh, these methods. And That's amazing. And, and I, I, yeah. I've never heard this before. Yeah. No, but uh, well, we, we presented that uh, at, at, at the Eurosense and, today, and we, we actually got all these papers as well to, to actually also indeed uh, to, to document our, our claim. And I knew it for many years ago that that, that was actually the case, but then uh, we, we found also then the evidence for that. Uh, so. Uh, but then uh, if you then look at how it developed, actually you can say like sensory science has developed or sensory food science because it's sort of like applied within the food area. It, it really developed uh, by, the, by a need, a need to have foods that can be preserved, that can be uh, processed, but that have uh, an acceptable uh, eating quality. And that's where uh, the sensory science uh, then came in to say like, okay, what is then the, uh, uh, an acceptable eating quality? And we needed to have methods around uh, measuring that. And then uh, we got the tools like a descriptive analysis uh, developed over the years, but also in the beginning, it was about discrimination testing and about simple quality tests with, with a sort of sheets uh, where people could tick boxes if it sort of fulfilled certain kind of uh, quality uh, or perceptible quality uh, uh, properties. So, uh, and that's also in the, in the field, if you look at it, uh, how we have it today, it's sort of, Still, uh, the way I look at it, it, it's still divided over three uh, pillars. Uh, one is on the analytical sensory, where we use trained panels, um, and, and, and then you could go also to expert uh, people. Then you have um, uh, the quality panels, dealing with the acceptability of products uh, being produced, uh, and also maybe over storage uh, time, so, so sort of trying to fulfill if a product uh, fulfills within the quality accept acceptable quality ranges defined by the producer, and then you have uh, the consumer, uh, and and then it is more about um, you can say uh, uh, he hedonic evaluation, but also about a lot of other things, about opinions, about all kind of things, about uh, habits. So you have three uh, so levels: the dis yeah. descriptive. The yeah. expert uh, and the consumer. Yeah, and the expert, you can call it, a, it's sort of the quality co uh, uh, quality panels. Uh, so so it's sort of the descriptive panels. They are, or, or, or the, the analytical sensory panels, they are often just trained to describe the sensory properties in a quantitative way. Intensities, uh, right? For instance, sensory intensities for different kind of uh, flavor notes, for different texture, uh, appearance, and so on. And do that in a in an objective way because these people, they are trained uh, to to sort of take away some of these biases that you have about if you like it or not, that's not important. It's about like, what can you find in the product and, yeah. and be trained in your brain analytically to, 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 to disentangle uh, the, uh, the flavor properties, for instance, and then trying to be precise uh, about a certain kind of aspects of that. But that's the analytical panel. And that's often used then to, to say, okay, uh, when we can do that, how does that relate to physics and to chemistry uh, and, and the knowledge that we, if we can do rheological measurements, uh, for instance, or we can look into the chemical composition of the, of the wood and how is that relate then to, to, the, to the sensory perception, then you can do that exercise. You can, and, y and, and you need to do that with analytical trained panels because if they're not uh, trained, um, you know, they are not aligned in the same uh, language yeah. and they are not aligned in the same kind of concepts. Uh, and, and these concepts, they're not only developed by the panel, but also by the panel leader and by experts around that, that actually have a knowledge about the, the chemistry and physics as well. You need to have them all together to, yeah. to bring that uh, to, to work well together. And, and of course, that is uh, not always possible in, 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 in all situations. Uh, but uh, if, you, if you really want to do it, you can say uh, uh, in, in the right way. You need to have all all yeah. these people to, uh, playing together. But then in the in the in the uh, in the quality control setting, it's a little bit different because then it's not about measuring intensities uh, necessarily. But then it's more about uh, like uh, are the products acceptable in a, in an acceptable range of a certain kind of intensity, for instance, or it's about detecting of off labels. But it's still not preferences, right? It no, and that's not preferences, but that's within uh, sort of within the, you can say, the company yeah. developed set of quality standards. And you have that in the coffee uh, business, but uh, the brewing uh, 
uh, brewers are, or what is it called, the brewers are a very good example of that. You have it in the wine business and other kind of businesses where people work within these kind of uh, quality methods. And then uh, you, you go to consumers. And then there is some other things around it as well, because in the end, it's always sort of the challenge to say, like, well, what is sort of... Um, uh, acceptable for a consumer and what is uh, sort of gets the, the consumer to to like a product uh, and how can we measure that uh, and, and 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 then you can say uh, just an analytical sensory panel cannot measure that it's just uh, trying to be objective about the properties and how you can measure that so and that's why they're trained for and that's only why they should stick to because if they're going to express how much they like or how uh, how how they view quality aspects of that then they they go more towards a subjective ju judgment and then with these very small panels of uh, say eight to twelve people you're not really sure whether that is sort of reflecting uh, the larger population and then you maybe draw conclusions that are bit, that that are risky yeah because you can ask them what they prefer but you just don't know how to interpret the answer because they are pretty randomly selected for preferences right they they are selected for skills and what they think is actually irrelevant in that setting. So just measuring, measuring their preferences, you have no way to conclude it because you didn't pick them up in a speci special geographical area or a special demographic or psychographic. You didn't choose them based on any kind of consumer concept that would help you predict uh, something for a consumer concept. They are pretty random from a preference perspective. So it's not that you can't measure it. You just don't know why it would be relevant. You don't know what to use those data for, right? But the intentions that they're coming out with, they are perfect, right? Because they are trained for it and yes. screened for that. Yes. Yeah, and so that's always, uh, if you go back to the very old uh, literature in sense science, uh, go back to the 1960s when we had Rosemary Pangborn developing uh, test methods uh, within the food science. And she, she always, well, what I then heard, I never met her in, in person, but what I heard about her is that she always said, we need to, disentangle these two things, uh, the hedonics from the analytical part uh, when it comes to the sensory properties. Uh, you should not mix that into uh, the same panel because uh, it also confuses the panel a little bit. And at the same time, as you say, uh, you have not a representative uh, sample of your population because this is these are people in the analytical uh, part. They are trained for, for a certain purpose. And, and their opinion is not so important. Uh, however, it, it, it is uh, very tempting to yeah. say like, oh, let's measure this uh, yeah. because we have some indication as to if this is a good product or, or highly liked product versus another one. And of course, you can say like you could, you, you could uh, have a sort of a second session and have, have a little bit data of these people just to, uh, to, 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 you can say, separate the very, very bad samples uh, out of the mix. But then I can say, like, well, why do that in that panel and why not in this small group of experts where you often have uh, a preliminary uh, pilot test uh, before yeah. you go to the descriptive panel? Why not doing it with those people that you have already some kind of a shifting of the samples and say, okay, these are the not so good samples. But then we would like to know about how they are described and how they are positioned according to the, uh, in relation to the other samples. Uh, but then I think you, you, you have other means of, of making some kind of a... Uh, you can say screening of uh, of uh, of sort of the good and and uh, the very off uh, samples, but um, we have to be a little bit careful because uh, it's also when when we're dealing then with these experts that are doing these pilot tests and so on, we have they they also have a certain mindset. Uh, and yeah. the best example in my career was um, uh, in the beginning uh, when I came here to the department. Uh, I was in a project together with a uh, with a company that was making starter cultures. And uh, our challenge was to uh, to see whether they could do a descriptive analysis on uh, on and this was buttermilk, and then uh, we said like oh wait, let's run it then at the company with the internal panel that they have and then let's run it at the university with our uh, external panel and the external panel is a panel where we get people in to the department that are selected uh, for their sensory abilities and then uh, they uh, enroll in our training program and then they learn about the methods and then they can they get paid for for participation and and then they could do this uh, analysis and the interesting thing was is that when we had this sort of trained uh, panel in our uh, laboratory which was the external panel and had no expert knowledge about buttermilk uh, they were more free in the way they could select uh, the vocabulary into describing the sensory properties. 
Whereas when we looked into the internal panel in the company, uh, they were all uh, dairy uh, experts, uh, people that knew about the cultures, uh, what they could do and what they could not do. And then buttermilk, uh, you know, they can taste of butter, but they cannot taste of yogurt because mm. uh, you don't have acetaldehyde uh, in, in, in buttermilk, <laughs> but you do have diacetyl. <coughs> and it had sort of this kind of mindset. And so, so certain words they could not use in that panel because they say it's not possible. Yeah. Whereas yeah. when we then looked into our panel, it was possible. It could, uh, buttermilk milk could taste of yogurt because it has, of course, the acidity and has things yeah. that associa the, have associations with the yogurt, aromas, perhaps. Yeah. And and so on. So 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 that was very interesting to compare actually this uh, to say like even though you have two, you can say objective panels. Yeah. Uh, you 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 have uh, the mindset of this panel and and where they come where you select the people from is actually also some influence on the outcome. However. When we then compared about uh, are, are these panels then fundamentally uh, evaluating the products differently, then in the product space was identical. So they could mm. show uh, exactly the differences between the samples, but ah. the warnings around that, yeah. uh, the definitions for how we could describe the differences in terms of the flavor properties, the, these words were, uh, were, were somewhat different. Yeah. But but the the, 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 the the space that we created in terms of the differences between the samples, they could very well say, like, this sample A was very different from sample B in a, in a cer certain aspects, but the, the wordings around it was a little bit different between the two panels. And that uh, comes to the challenge in, in, in sensory sciences often about how do we define sensory attributes. And it's also in the coffee business, it's it's so difficult because if you say it's it, it, it's roasted, um, or it is toasted, or it is uh, uh, burnt. Uh, uh, like you, you need to uh, really have good standards for that as well. To 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 say like, what do we mean with that? And we need to appreciate also that maybe for one company they have to find uh, burnt in one way uh, or roasted in one way, whereas another one has a slightly different view of that and a slightly different standard in how to train the panel for that. And that has been always a challenge uh, in the sensory fields, even when we publish data, because I always say like we need to uh, the publish the definition and also the reference uh, standard yeah. that we use. Yeah. And we should actually also add something about the precision of the reference standard, because a reference standard is always an approximation of what people uh, perceive. So if we, even though we define the attribute with a reference standard, it's sometimes not exactly match on, but it is good enough to illustrate the property, yeah, and and we are sometimes uh, we we take sometimes too much uh, we draw too much conclusion then on the attributes, whereas we say okay what was it really that we measured here? So that question we always have to add uh, to to the interpretation and also then to the discussion if you compare it with somebody else uh, that has done also analysis and then. Uh, have maybe uh, used the same words, but actually meant something different. Yeah. So yeah. this sensory communication and, 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 and trying to really be precise on that is very important. And that's on the intensity side of it, right? And, and, and this is where in the coffee business, we rarely get there because people are so hooked up in this SCA uh, coffee form where you're scoring qualities. And this is where I'm really, uh, it annoys me so much that, that, that this uh, protocol is so widespread because when you're scoring qualities, that's hedonic, right? And for me, the way I kind of uh, distinguish between a profiling and a consumer study is that in the profiling, you're investigating the food substance, and in the, in a, uh, in the hedonic, you're investigating the customers. So you're actually not investigating the food substance when you're doing a food study because you already did that, right? Yeah. You found out how does the food taste, and the next question is who likes what? Yeah. So, 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 uh, if you have hedonic data, it's in, it's it's not about the food; it's about the uh, uh, the consumers, right, or the people tasting it. So you're actually mapping something out about them. Where on the when it's in it's in in the profiling, it's about the food. So if you have a protocol like the SCA with uh, a coping form where you're scoring qualities, and it's used as if it says something about the coffee. Then that's the category error that I that really annoys me because then then because what what if it says something uh, so if you get a score it's not helpful because it it says something about this group of experts but really you hope for it to be some kind of consumer prediction tool or quality has to be something with consumers right otherwise it's irrelevant 
but really you've just only said something about the experts. You haven't said anything about the product and you haven't don't have a strategic way of going from that number to any other because it, it, we just assume that they are right. And so it's just a model that takes like exactly nowhere because it says something about something that we don't even know. We think it says something about the coffees, but it really says something about the consumers and there's no link to kind of how to link this to other people, right? So it's just you paint with, with that uh, pr uh, protocol, you're painting the whole, the whole industry into a corner where nothing can be gained. And this is what my point with, this is simple stuff, right? This, this, is, this, is, this is simple concept from, from theory of science, understanding the conclusions. What is it that I'm trying to say something about? How do I get at the data correctly so I'm not making a wrong conclusion? And this protocol is used in the two big education systems promoted. So in my mind, there are thousands and thousands and thousands and thousands of people who are getting a prestigious education to learn a wrong protocol. That, that's, that's, I, I know that this okay. is a bit arrogant and there might be things I haven't understood, but this far, this is how I see it. And that's, yeah. that's why I talk so much about it. But, but I, if I can reflect on that, I think it's, uh, you need to understand why this has developed as sort of the golden standard uh, approach to measuring the coffee quality. And it's a little bit uh, when we went back to time in sensory science, like where did it came from and how did the things help? And I think a lot of these things have ha have developed over many years of uh, of practicing and discussing and then sort of say, okay, this is how we're going to measure it. But they have not been developed by people that have sort of a necessarily a scientific uh, approach or or, 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 or learned about the theory of science. So it is often by some kind of a practitioner's uh, view that it has been developed, which I think is it's it's valid in itself to 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 you know you you, you learn by doing, um, but then you come to an end point and then you say this is the golden standard, <laughs> and there uh, you then say okay what is it then actually what you measure, and I think that's the question to ask, yes. because uh, in the end uh, you can then still measure. And then say, okay, I can actually only conclude then around this here, uh, because. But but it, that, that that that's the critical thing. And and I think in any kind of uh, progress, you need to be able to say like, okay, now we have developed this, and this is our golden standard. But we also need to be self-critical and say, okay, it has been developed over decades, and this is sort of how everybody has been doing it, and now we're saying like, this is how you should do it. Uh, but uh, there will always be sort of a sort of a little revolution. You can say to <laughs> say like now we need to sort of say like was it really what we intended and is it good enough for, for the kind of purposes that we're using this? And then uh, I also want to criticize the analytical sensory because I for the usefulness because you can say like okay it's very useful to to exactly measure the sensory properties and 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 define that in a which analytical panel. But then it does not answer the, 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 the question that the coffee business want to answer. Is this a good cup of coffee? Or is this within our sort of defined quality range? And so therefore, I, I, I think the, the analytical sensory also misses things. So what we have done over the years um, is to say like, well, how can we introduce other kind of attributes uh, in the sensory evaluation with our trained panel? So we have then worked with so-called meta att attributes where we say like, okay, these are not purely sensory attributes but the attributes that describe sort of quality aspects. So we have like uh, freshness, and then we can define freshness for different kind of products. Mm. Uh, we have introduced uh, uh, balance, uh, introduced harmonic, uh, different kind of words that could sort of capture more overall the quality, quality of the product. And what we si saw when we introduced that into our descriptive uh, panel, we actually could work with that, and they are very, very reliable attributes. And it gives us then an education like within the space of the sensory where you say like, oh, this is the bitter sample and this is the sample that has uh, some kind of vanilla uh, aspect to it. And But then when you look at that space, you need to be really trained to yeah. see what is the what are the quality uh, 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 products in this here. Whereas if you then say like, okay, here we have the balance that is sort of uh, goes between certain kind of aspects. And you say, okay, so here is more the balanced coffee uh, and here is more the 
uh, and and then you could could but help. You, uh, but to, you do take responsibility as a researcher to calibrate people. So you you define very carefully what is uh, balance and what is unbalanced. We, in, in yeah, well, we have not really trained them actually on uh, what is uh, then the balanced. Mm. Uh, but we give them a definition uh, and discuss that a little bit. Uh, so we have not really done that in a very objective manner where you sort of like this should be the balance. For instance, sweet sour uh, yeah. balance. Eh? Uh, we just let it a little bit loose to the panel mm. because we did not want to draw too much attention to that. And so we said, like, let's see what we can get out of that. And then we saw the times that we used that was actually uh, the the panel had some ideas about that. But uh, and that is, I think, different from the hedonic still. It's sort of going towards that, but yeah. it is still, I think you could sort of, it's sort of a yeah. mi midway and it's some kind of a compromise. Uh, and it do, it's not aligned with the orthodox uh, kind of uh, descriptive, right? No, it's a but bit it, experimental. It, it, yeah, but it's introducing some of these meta concepts. Uh, it's sort of, se se but you need to, again, each time you need to discuss that. Like, what what is the purpose for the experiment? And then you can sort of say, like, yeah. do we want to include this, and which ones do we want to include? Uh, because you also don't want to draw too much attention to them if you want to have a really analytical exercise. So then you just don't want them. Yeah, to, or at to, least you, to you are very conscious about you've yeah. got the specific descriptors and the experiential meta descriptors. Yeah. And and you you distinguish between what kind of conclusions yeah. you dare to draw yeah. about each of them, right? Because in the end, it's trying to get uh, what is the qual what is quality, eh? and trying yeah. to answer that qu uh, question and what is then you can say good versus bad quality. And and I think that is uh, and and that is I think the challenge in 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 this uh, in the coffee business then to say like well if we sort of want to measure quality of coffee, then uh, the quality will be defined by the individual that is sort of perceiving the coffee, and if I am a naive consumer, if, if you can call a uh, consumer naive because <laughs> I think a lot of consumers drink coffee every day, <laughs> yeah. but they never really have thought much about it. Yeah. Uh, and for them, then a quality coffee is probably the coffee that they used to drink every day. And so if you then introduce them, then a very high-end quality coffee yeah. that is much less roasted and has a lovely uh, all kind of flavor notes, uh, they yeah. would say, that's uh, I don't like that coffee. That's not a good quality. I, I like to have the over-roasted uh, coffee that I drink every morning when yeah. I have my breakfast. And so, but then in the coffee uh, business, uh, they have a very different view about quality. Uh, and the, the, the risk in this is to, to say like, okay, who, who is right here? And who, who in the end uh, do you want to, to present your coffee? So on the one hand, you maybe want to have the consumer to say like, well, can you open up maybe for some more interesting cup of coffees? Do you, are you willing to do that? And a whole bunch of consumers say no. And then there may be some, some sort of novelty seekers say, oh, let's, let's try. Uh, uh, and then at the same time, you need to look into the coffee business and say like, well, what you perceive as a high quality coffee is maybe not high quality. Yeah, uh, that's in, in, in your sort of mindset, a high quality coffee. Yeah. But, uh, so, so, but because you have learned to sort of appreciate that and, and you can see all the, the whole story around that and understand why it is uh, then p defined as high quality. But then if you do the sensory measurements, what, what should we actually measure? Yeah. That is the, that's yeah. the, 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 the big challenge. And, 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 and therefore, I think it's very important uh, if you sort of say, say, let's just put everything aside in terms of the, uh, uh, you, uh, you, you, you could say the methodology that has been developed, um, and just to say, okay, what is the what is the question we want to answer? Yes. And then define the question, and then you say, okay, how can we measure that? And then in some cases you can say, okay, the the um, the, the methods of the International Coffee Association or or the the, the 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 standards that have been developed, they can they are good enough to answer that question. But in other cases, uh, well, if you want to know more about the phenomenon, it's maybe yeah. not enough. Uh, we need to do go into the different direction. And that's also my point. It's not that I, I think it it, it has some purposes, and that that's another uh, one of my point that forms follows function. That you should use the method that is appropriate to answer the question that you want to know. So I'm not saying it's n it's never relevant. I'm just saying it's used in a lot of areas where it's not relevant. Yeah. And for example, I get uh, a lot of uh, requests to be a, a, a reviewer every time it's coffee. I think my name pops up somewhere. And when I see that the SCA protocol is used, is used for, qu uh, for, for correlating qualities to something, I just uh, immediately just write that it's not, sci it, 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 it's, it's not scientific. Take out this, and if you still have enough uh, interesting stuff left, then you have an article. But if you take this out and there's nothing left, there's no article. So unless the, the article is about 
investigating something about the protocol, right? Then then it would be great. But if it's just uh, some chemical things and then the SCA protocol where they've used uh, two and a half Q grader to, to score and get amazing p-values yeah. even though they, it was only three people measuring, yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. It, it, I, that's just so many alarm uh, <laughs> things yes. that you cannot get small p-values with, with three people and not if they use a protocol that's not. so that's one thing that i don't even believe that it's done properly <laughs> but but the big problem is that they try to use it to predict quality and you cannot do that it's 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 um, uh, it, it's it's it doesn't is other q graders or other people doing the same would get an opposite result it's just a random outcome yeah. and and then then uh, I, I i don't i think it should be taken out it could be taken as if you do a study you could use you could do a, a descriptive analysis and a consumer study, and then you could see how the SCA copying form with five Q graders mix into that whole thing. That would be an interesting thing. But if you take this out and there's nothing left, then there's nothing, right? So that that's that's yeah. my that's the my uh, kind of standard reaction to that protocol yeah. being used as if it's just a descriptive analysis and a consumer study combined. Yeah. Now uh, that the last point, I agree, but but I, I would be less critical in a way that uh, on on your p-values. I think uh, if you see a p-value that is uh, then significant or defined as significant, then basically means that there are huge differences. Uh, so that one coffee is so everybody agrees that that's so different from the other ones, and then of course that that uh, probably will, <laughs> will I, be I significant. Agree. I agree. Uh, you can get a low p-value if you either have a big difference. Or have a lot of people documenting a small difference. Yes. So, but and that's my point. If you have, you can see the samples are really not very different, and you see a low p-value with a few people. That's oh, when my alarm uh, goes yeah. off. Yeah. Then, then uh, they they must be extremely well aligned. These people. Exactly. Uh, so extremely good experts. On quality. Uh, yes. Yeah. On, and on then what's the point, right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But yeah. So so I agree. It's uh, the, 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 it should. Yeah, I, I would also say I, uh, yeah, one, one should do should be able to do that uh, a little bit better. Uh, <laughs> uh, so and, and then I agree also that that maybe that's not a good way of including uh, that in a scientific uh, 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 work uh, that one wants to publish. Because uh, because uh, that's another thing is that uh, and and that's uh, within the science. If we're going back again to the beginning of this conversation on the theory of science, uh, if you do an experiment uh, and you then uh, want to conclude on that, so then if you run a second experiment to, to repeat it it should be also reproducible exactly so the yeah. outcome should be reproducible so yeah. and it's not necessarily then with that panel but you need to then run it with another team exactly. that can reproduce that outcome exactly. and that should be uh, challenged then in in that situation because if they can show that they when they go and measure it with another panel with a similar method and they again show that this is uh, uh, different and it is uh, that, uh, in the same way different, then, then you can say, okay, then there is more validity to, to the experimental approach. But if they cannot do that, yeah. then, it, then it is just uh, sort of, and, and that is a risk that you then try to maybe um, have some kind of an idea and trying to towards proving uh, what, the, what you have thought was right. And, uh, and, and I think that is not scientific because you need to uh, have an open, open view to say, okay, we, we're going to measure this and we can repeat it. And, and that's why I always say, um, uh, in, in sensory science, they have these rapid methods developed, uh, like, for instance, projective mapping. And th and I, I say, like, they are so noisy if you only run one experiment. So you need to always repeat. So, so any kind of sensory measurement should be repeated on a second day yeah. uh, when you have, again, uh, a similar panel uh, coming in, doing the judgment, and so that you can show that what you have uh, is uh, repeatable and if not then you say like okay we need to rethink again how we do the experiment or we need to train more or the rest uh, the method is not uh, right and that's the self-critical point right that that you have to how can i be wrong in this conclusion and if people just put in the sca uh, copying form in a research project without even questioning in the validity yeah. then they just fall for that point in my in my mind and yeah. then at least uh, uh, kind of discuss why this is even relevant rather than, oh, the coffee uh, organizations must be good enough. And yeah. historically, it's just uh, shown that... It but uh, but I, I, I also must say I, I'm, I, I appreciate that people have developed these methods within uh, in the branch and, and in the coffee branches and one example, but in, in, in the wine uh, industry, they have also these kind of quality assessments uh, schemes. And I also teach in that in the wine course. And... And in the beginning, I was sort of uh, quite critical about, oh, you can't do it. But then 
later on when you think about it, you say like, oh, actually, it's it's okay. It's sort of some kind of a practical way of scoring. Um, but then it's just say, okay, what is the, the, the limitations then to that outcome? Exactly, yeah. Like if you, for instance, uh, say like, well, we want to uh, score for a Bourgogne uh, uh, Pinot Noir uh, wine that has sort of a certain characteristics for that region. Then you have your scoring sheet and you go through all the th marks, but then you have in your mindset, it should be a Bourgogne Pinot Noir uh, wine where you say, okay, there I have like a certain ranges with regard to the color, with regard to the flavors and so on. And so, and then you say, is that a good uh, Bourgogne Pinot Noir? Uh, and then you sort of start to, uh, to, to rate it according to that quality mm, standard that yeah, you have in yeah. your mind that you have been trained on. Yeah. And that's, I think, also maybe in the coffee uh, evaluation s scheme that you refer to, that if you say like, okay, what is then a sort of a good coffee? And then how, then in, in a way you, s you measure what is deviating from your concept of what is a good coffee yeah. or what should be this kind of coffee from this kind of uh, processing or something. And I think in itself, that's a valid measurement. Uh, so I'm not one to criticize it. It's just that to say like, okay, uh, but it does not say much about what the consumer will tell or what what is the underlying understanding of why it's a good coffee. Exactly, then you yeah. need to have other approaches yeah. uh, for measuring. And that's also my point. I, I if, if somebody asked me to do an SCA scoring of a coffee, I know who I would send it to to get some data that I kind of think is something I can use. So it's not that I dismiss it completely but I just see the relevance of it very, very rarely, and I see it used all the time. So I guess that, that, that would, uh, well, that's what annoys me. And this is my, my, uh, where I might be a little pangborn soldier, that, yeah. that, 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 okay, this is sometimes relevant, perhaps in 3% of the times, and then, then the seven, uh, 97%, we need to kind of introduce uh, uh, intensities and qualities as something that is not mixed. And, yeah. and, and that's, yeah. that's really... Yeah, I think you are much more into that business, of course, than I am. So, so I, I cannot uh, really say if I agree or don't agree no, no. <laughs> on that. But uh, I think one needs to always have an open mind and have a, a, a and and then coming back again, have uh, the, the 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 questions uh, clear. What does it want to measure? And don't go per default to a exactly. standard method. Yeah. Say like this is what everybody does, and this is what being developed by that. So we're taking that method because exactly. that is the golden standard, and this is the only way we can measure. That is a really a yeah. wrong uh, choice. Uh, you need to be much more uh, critical in that and say, okay, what is it, what I want to measure? And then if that method can partly uh, give you an answer, okay, yeah. you take that part of the method to show that. And there should be a certain flexibility if you want to do it in a scientific way. However, if you're working in a, in a business where you say like, well, we need to have a, a, a standard where everybody can refer to, and if everybody does it in the same way, then we can get sort of, that we can comp compare across uh, the business. And that is a bit how I understand this system. Yeah. Then, then I say like, uh, um, are you really sure that the way you measured in these panels across the globe, uh, that you uh, that you can really um, uh, compare the, these results because there might be some uh, some personal views or opinions in 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 built into this way of measuring that m makes that if you measure it in Mexico and you measure it in Honduras and here in Denmark that people have a different concept about that and then and in fact which proves is it really a consumer study. Yes, and then <laughs> and then you show that okay, actually it's not uh, something that can be reproduced uh, yeah. across the globe. And then you can say this methodology that does does not really match the uh, uh, the, the purpose in which exactly. it has been developed. And there you need to have and an open mind. And that's uh, where my form follows function point comes in that you need yeah. to make sure to choose a method that answers exactly the question that you're looking for. And this is where there's confusion yeah, all over the yeah, place. Yeah. Yeah. So Actually, when we we are out of time, and uh, you worried that we that we wouldn't have enough to talk about, and I haven't, I think I'm halfway down the list of my questions. So that just proves that we have a lot to talk about. But uh, I think, in respect of, of your time, that uh, that I'll uh, round it off here, and uh, and really again, thank you so much for your your time. And it's it's the first time that I've discussed the SCA copying form where people actually gave me really valuable uh, kind of, uh, not criticism, but kind of um, uh, something to think about. And if, no, uh, if not you, who then, uh, the, when, <laughs> who should do that? <laughs> so I really ap appreciate that.
So um, we will obviously uh, keep on working together uh, uh, with the uh, EDAS uh, PhD. So it might be that we could do a, a podcast about that uh, when it's done in the new year or or whenever um, uh, we could uh, we could find some time again. But um, I really appreciate and uh, my listeners uh, also appreciate that you took out uh, time to, to discuss these uh, really weird things, actually. This, this, this discussion yes. doesn't really happen a lot <laughs> around the world, I'm pretty sure. Yes. So this is really uh, unique. So thank you so much for your time. Yeah, you're welcome, Martin. Thank you. Great. Thank you.